So right now we're Parsons Korach, and there's um, you know a, a side plot to the story. Of course, Korach, he launches his rebellion against Moshe, against Aaron. He says, Moshe's not legitimate. Aaron's not legitimate. I should be the high priest. And he gets with him some, some collaborators, some co-conspirators. It tells us that there are 250 men who are important men, who are Rashi Sanadros, they're leaders amongst the people, and they join the rebellion. And there's a, a gentleman by the name of Own Ben Peles who joins the rebellion, but ultimately his wife saves him and he's spared. And then there's two brothers, Dathan and Abiram, Dasan and Abiram. And they are almost the ringleaders of this, of this coup attempt, of this insurrection. And Moshe interacts with them a few times in our Parsha. He tries to get them to, to, to meet with him, just to discuss it. And they're very uh, curt and uh, disrespectful in their response. We're not going to ascend with you. And ultimately, they get swallowed up in the ground in this uh, magically appearing sinkhole, and they are lost forever. That's the story. The, the, the fundamental story of the parasha is the, is, the, is the rebellion of Korach, is the mutiny of Korach, and Moshe tries to quell the protest and, and to quiet the discord, but ultimately the conspirators die, and some of them die in, in, in the sinkhole, and some of them are consumed in the fire, and then later on, there are those who die in a plague. But these two co-conspirators, Dathan and Abiram, they appear in many places in the Torah. They have a very unusual storyline. So in our parsha, Moshe, he's, you know, he's addressing Korach, and he's also addressing Dathan and Abiram, and he specifically reaches out to them. This is in verse 12 of our parsha, And he says, come, let's talk about it. And they respond, Lo na'ale, we're not going to ascend. And then the verse tells us what, what they continued with. And they accuse Moshe of these awful things. They tell him, is it not enough that you took us out of a land flowing with milk and honey? That term, land flowing with milk and honey, that's the term that's applied to the land of Israel. But they apply to the land of Egypt. They say, the land of Egypt is the land flowing with milk and honey. And that's where you took us out. So you, you downgraded us. And you're causing us to die in the wilderness. Are you going to lord over us? And you promised us to bring us to a land flowing with milk and honey, but you didn't. And uh, are you going to gouge out our eyes? Even if you gouge out our eyes, we're not going to come to you. So the Torah really details the very fierce and strident response that Dathan and Abiram give to Moshe, and ultimately they're swallowed up, and, and that's really the last that we hear of them. But they have a very unusual backstory, and, and they appear in many different places. And the fact that we have these two characters that appear in so many places in the Torah, there's obviously a lesson behind it, and there's some, there's some purpose that they play, and there's a crucial role that they play in the larger story of, of the Torah. Now, the Midrash and the Talmud they fill in a lot of the stories and they give us a peek behind the curtain and they tell us, and they demonstrate how in many instances, in many places in the storyline, these two brothers, Dathan and Abiram, B'nai Aliyah, the sons of Aliyah, they actually played many roles in the past. So for example, when Moshe, the first episode of him as an adult in chapter 2 of, Gen of, of Exodus, he goes out to inspect on the well-being of his brethren, and he sees an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his fellow. And he looks to the right, and he looks to the left, and he sees that no one's watching, and he strikes the Egyptian, buries him in the sand. Very dramatic introduction to Moshe as an adult. Of course, as a baby, he was put into the, the Nile, and he's picked up by Pharaoh's daughter. We know that story. As an adult, he goes out and he witnesses the plight of his brethren, and that's the introduction to Moshe as an adult, he's someone who is empathetic to the pain, to the suffering, and to the plight of his brethren. And then the verse tells us that it was on the second day. And again, Moshe is going out. He once again witnesses a fight, a scuffle. But this time it's not an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man, it's two Hebrew men. And he says to the Russia, to the wicked one, Lama Sakariacha, why do you hit your friend? Moshe is intervening and trying to break up a fight between two Jews. 
And they respond to him, are you better than us? Are you in charge? Are you a judge? Are you a minister? Are you going to kill us like you killed the guy yesterday? And Moshe realizes, oh, the matter has become known. And Moshe is pursued. And Moshe is arrested. And Pharaoh discovers Moshe, Moshe, Moshe's crime because of these two individuals. And he wants to execute Moshe. But Moshe flees and he he goes to Midian. And that's where he, he meets uh, Jethro's daughter and gets married. And that's how the story continues. Now, who are these two anonymous Hebrews? So Rashi tells us, Shnei Anashem Ivrim, two Hebrew men, Dasan ve'aviram, Dathan and Abiram. So at the very beginning of Moshe's, Moshe's adulthood narrative, he witnesses two Hebrews fighting and he calls them a Russia, a wicked one. Why do you hit your fellow? So Moshe is equating the wicked one and the fellow. And Rashi says they're both wicked because there's the wicked one and the wicked one's fellow, the wicked one's peer. The wicked ones equal. Dathan and Abiram, the first introduction that we have to them is that they are both wicked. And they respond to him, you're going to kill us like you killed the guy yesterday, and they go to, to Pharaoh. How does Pharaoh discover what happened between Moshe and the Egyptian? It's because of Dathan and Abiram. So if you think about it, Moshe's storyline is a very unusual storyline. He's in Egypt, they want to kill him because they want to kill all the Hebrews, all the baby boys. He he somehow ends up in Pharaoh's palace in this miraculous fashion. And now he's an adult and he's kind of channeling this incredible care and concern and compassion that he has for his brethren. And he has to flee, go to, go to Midian, depart from his nation. If you were to think of a, a storyline of the savior of the Jewish people, it shouldn't include this diversion where he leaves the scene for 60 years, shows up at the age of 80. But that's what happened to Moshe. That's the storyline. He, he goes to Midian as a result of Dathan and Abiram, where they tell Pharaoh of Moshe's crime after Moshe intervenes and tries to break up their fight. So if you think about it, these, these people, they're at the very beginning of the story, and, and they're, they're wicked. The first one told that they're wicked, and, and they're fighting and we discover in the Midrashic commentary, this was not just, you know, some sort of arm wrestle, some playground scuffle. Midrash tells us that they're they're fighting to the death. They were really going at each other. And Moshe is trying to reprimand them. Wicked ones, why, why do you strike your fellow? And they don't accept that. Typically, the, the quality of the righteous is when someone says something, you're doing something wrong, maybe they have a point. But they they just reject it. They refuse to accept the reprimandation and castigation of Moshe. And they go and form on Moshe. And they set up Moshe to be killed. Moshe happens to flee in a miraculous fashion. But Moshe is condemned to die and is forced to flee and go into exile as a result of them. And this is almost the, the, the first conflict between Dathan and Abiram and, and Moshe, but it's definitely not the last. But, but these are serious people in that they're playing a major role in determining the trajectory of Moshe and thus the trajectory of the whole story that ensues. We're told in the Midrash that Moshe had to flee when he was 20. He goes to Midian and he only returns to the scene in Egypt after the Burning Bush episode, as we know. He returns at the age of, of 80. So that whole 60-year period of Moshe's life, when he is away from his brethren, and we believe he's acquiring the skills and the personality and the and the character to be able to lead the Jewish people, to be able to lead the lead the Jewish people out of Egypt, that's all the handiwork of Dathan and Abiram. Now they appear again. Moshe comes back and he wants to save the Jewish people and he goes to speak to the elders and he does some signs and he persuades them and they march to Pharaoh to the palace. And Pharaoh says, who's God? I'm like, who are you? How do you even get in here? 
I'm not going to release the Jewish people. I, I'm going to make their situation even worse. It's obvious, says Pharaoh, that they have too much time on their hand. We're going to maintain the daily quota and withhold from them the necessary ingredients to make bricks. So Moshe's first attempt to secure the nation's freedom not only does it not improve their situation, it actually worsens it. Pharaoh increases, increases, increases the workload and the people suffer even more. And then the verse tells us, this is the end of chapter 5 of Exodus, the foreman of the Jewish people, they seek an audience with Pharaoh. And they tell Pharaoh, why did you do this? Why are you worsening our plight? And Pharaoh responds, well, the reason I'm doing it is because you want to leave. You want to go uh, worship your God. You have to work even harder. And the verse tells us, this is Exodus 5.20, that when they leave Pharaoh's audience, they encounter Moshe and Aaron. And they attack Moshe and Aaron. They accost him. And they level very harsh accusations against Moshe and Aaron. And again, the Midrash tells us, who are these people? Dathan and Abiram. And then they appear again after the Exodus. Jewish people are fleeing from Pharaoh. Pharaoh discovers that the nation has no intention of returning back to Egypt. And he rallies his troops and they pursue and they surround the nation. And the people are, are frightened. This is chapter 14, verse 10. And, and they cry out to God. And they tell Moshe, verse 11, so this is 14 11, they tell Moshe, are there insufficient graves in Egypt? You bring us here to die in the wilderness? Mazos Asis Alonu, what did you do to us to take us out of, of Egypt? Why did you take us out of Egypt? This is what we told you in Egypt, continue these people. It's better for us to worship Pharaoh, to serve Pharaoh, to be enslaved by Pharaoh than to leave and to die in the wilderness. Even after all the miracles, even after the plagues, we're told Dathan and Abiram are still complaining. And then we have a fourth instance with the manna. The manna, you were not allowed to preserve some manna for the following day, and you cannot go out and collect the manna on Shabbos. Chapter 16, we find that there were people that violated both of those instructions. Who are they? Dathan and Abiram. And finally, in last week's parsha, in Parsha's Shlach, the spies give a negative report about the land, and someone tells his brother, let us appoint a head and return to Egypt. This is in 14.4 of Numbers. Nit narosh, but it was right, but let us appoint a head and return to Egypt. Who are these people? This man to his brother, the Midrash tells us, Dathan and Abiram. The only people that upon hearing what the spies said about the land, said, let us go back to Egypt. Just Dathan and Abiram. They're the ones who are forever married to Egypt, so to speak. In our parsha, they call Egypt the land flowing with milk and honey, and they are perpetually the nemeses of Moshe and Aaron. In instance after instance. And in our parasha, this is when it finally ends for them. They are consumed alive. And the Kabbalistic literature tells us they were consumed alive. They were unrepentant to the very end. 
continues the Kabbalistic literature, they stay alive because in every generation, there is a version of Dathan and Abiram that are reincarnated because these are malcontents that forever and ever and ever stand up and try to repudiate the agenda of Moshe and Aaron. So it's a very interesting storyline, this, this narrative of these people. And there's a lot of very fascinating questions that we can ponder. For one, we know that 80% of the Jews did not make it out of Egypt. They wanted to stay there. So it's kind of unusual that we have these two people that are always saying, let's stay here. Why are you trying to get us to leave? Land of Egypt is the land flowing with milk and honey. And they somehow made it out. And it's also interesting that their storyline ends over here. All their previous misdeeds were not enough to get them buried alive. This is what precipitated their, their ultimate demise. All their previous sins apparently had no consequences. When they said, let's appoint uh, heads to return to Egypt with the spies, nothing happened to them. The manna, all their sins of the manna, that did not eliminate them. Complaining, are there insufficient graves in Egypt by the spilling of the sea? That did not condemn them to die. When they forced Moshe into exile, that was not grounds for them to be eliminated. So it's, it's a fascinating question to, to ponder what exactly are is the significance of these two people. And it seems like the fact that they were the ones that really triggered Moshe's departure to Midian, which was necessary for his development as the leader, it seems like they, they, they play an actual role in the development of the nation, in the development of Moshe. And that is a fascinating idea that these two people, nemeses of Moshe and Aaron, sinners from beginning to end, they actually play a constructive role in the development and the formation of the nation and its foremost leaders. <laughs> And the commentaries, the Maharal, they tell us something unbelievable. And they explain, the Maharal explains, Dathan and Abiram are always in opposition to Moshe and Aaron. Because if the Jewish people merited two giants as great as Moshe and Aaron, who are righteous, they must also have two giants that are terribly weak, wicked in the same to, the, to the same degree that Moshe and Aaron are righteous. You have to have two giants that are to the same degree in the opposite direction. And that is Dathan and Abiram. If you have a Moshe and you have an Aaron, you must have an anti-Moshe and an anti-Aaron. If there's someone with such, with such holiness, with such purity, with such power as Moshe, there must be someone who is equally powerful operating on the opposite side. Has to be like that. Otherwise, there's no, there's no balance. And that's why they were needed and they're present from the very beginning up to this point. Now, if you extend this idea a bit further you'll find something very, very interesting and almost problematic. The Maharal is telling us that if you have a Moshe, you have to have a Dathan. If you have an Aaron, you must have an Abiram. That means that if you eliminate Dathan and you eliminate Abiram, you must also necessarily eliminate Moshe and Aaron. That's a, a striking statement. There must always be a balance. You cannot have someone whose power of purity is so immense unless you have someone who is operating with the same power on the opposite side. And if the model is telling us that, that 
Daytime beer are the anti motion and anti iron. You have to have them both, or else it's not balanced accordingly. In our parsha, Dathan and Abiram are eliminated. Moshe and Aaron are now unopposed. It has to be that this elimination of Dathan and Abiram will result in the death of Moshe and Aaron. And in fact, in Eshi's parsha, we'll read about the episode of Moshe and Aaron striking the rock that was supposed to speak with the rock and, and they struck the rock instead. And Aaron dies and Moshe is condemned to die. According to this Maharal, it makes sense. If you lose the counterweight, you must necessarily lose the other side. And perhaps, by the way, this answers one of the questions that we could have posed, or that we, we referenced earlier. There was a need to tolerate Dathan and Abiram, notwithstanding their terrible wickedness, because they were necessary. They have to be around, and they have to be endowed with their power, because otherwise we don't have a counterweight for Moshe and Aaron, and we must lose them. And that's a, that's a very interesting point. Not only are they there to serve as a counterweight, but they need to be there. And if we don't have them, we cannot have Moshe and Aaron. And we can speculate. The verse, when it talks about the death of Dathan and Abiram, the verse, chapter 16, verse 33, the verse stresses that they were swallowed alive. Maybe we can speculate that the reason why that they have to maintain, they have to be alive to a certain extent, if they were totally, totally, totally dead, well, then Moshe and Aaron would not be able to be alive at all. So they're kept alive only to enable the continuation of Moshe and Aaron, but once they're they're effectively dead, it has to be the Moshe and Aaron must must die as well. But this is the idea that the Maral is introducing to us. There's always ha- there always has to be a balance. We're familiar with the idea that there used to be a very intense desire for idolatry. Today, the notion of bowing down and genuflecting to an idol sounds so absurd and there's no appeal. We don't see the appeal. And it could kind of bother us, like why why do people in antiquity, well, like why were they so obsessed with this? Why would they build so many temples and do so much uh, child sacrifice and animal sacrifice to these deities of wood and stone? It makes no sense to us. Well, the Talmud tells us there used to be an intense desire that outweighs any desire that we have today. But the sages prayed to eliminate that desire. And indeed, they were successful. And today, no no longer do people have the intense desire that they used to have to worship idols. However, there has to be a counterweight. And the counterweight to the lust for idolatry was prophecy. You have an Elijah, you have an Elisha, you have a Samuel. You have a prophet of such prestige and capability and aptitude and holiness. That could be one side of the balance and the other side could be the desire for idolatry. With the elimination of the desire for idolatry went prophecy. It has to be has to be like that. Moshe and Aaron could not have emerged if not for Dathan and Abiram. And accordingly, Dathan and Abiram, these terrible people that all they do is cause problems, what the Maral is telling us is that because of them, Moshe and Aaron were able to achieve their greatness. 
And Moshe, you know, the first thing that Dathan and Abiram did to him was to send him into exile for 60 years. You would imagine that someone that causes you so much anguish and misfortune would be someone that you'd be very antagonistic towards. But when we zoom out and we see the full story, we understand that these two were presented to the world, were placed in the world for the express purpose as uh, of serving as Moshe's foil, Moshe and Aaron's foil. And through the existence of these terrible people, Moshe and Aaron were able to emerge. I think the lesson for us is when someone has an enemy, when someone has a challenge, when someone has a nemesis, it's possible that the Almighty placed that person or that force or that challenge, the Almighty placed it in our path in order to accentuate our growth and our greatness. And we have to understand that the more potential that we have for greatness, necessarily we're going to have a fiercer Yetzirah and we're going to have a fiercer manifestation of that counterweight in the form of our nemesis. People that have greater ability and more outstanding skill, the Moshe's and the Aaron's must be aware that they're going to encounter the fiercest and most talented of nemeses. And they're going to have to endure the greatest challenges and tests. A year and a half ago, I recorded a podcast, one of my favorite podcasts, which was titled Forefathers and Four Uncles. Anyone who listened to that podcast remembers it. And the, the idea was is that you, you read Genesis and you see these, these the forefathers, right? How many forefathers were there? So we think there's three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the truth is there's really four. Why? Because you have Abram, Isaac, and Jacob has really two personalities. There's Jacob and there's Israel. And we spoke about this in the past, how really it was supposed to be Asaph. He was supposed to be the fourth forefather. But he chose a different path, and therefore Jacob had to adopt so to speak, the greatness of Esau and, and assimilate it within himself. And that's the Israel character. So if you have four forefathers, you also have four, four uncles. Because if you look at the story, Abraham's story is all intertwined with the story of Lot. He's like the uncle, because he's, he's Sarah's brother. And the whole story of Abraham is, 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 is intertwined with that of Lot. What Dathan and Abiram were to Moshe and Aaron, Lot was to Abraham. And if you zoom in on the story of Lot and Abraham, you'll find that the quality that Abraham most exhibited was the same quality that Lot had in a corrupted version. Isaac his counterweight, his nemesis, was Ishmael. And because Jacob really has two roles to play, he has two nemeses, Esau, Esau, and Laban. And in that podcast, Four Fathers and Four Uncles went through exactly all the qualities of the forefathers and demonstrated how each particular nemesis, the four uncle, so to speak, the, the flip side of these great men, it was a tailored foil, so to speak. The, the particular quality and attribute that most uh, was that was most manifested in the great person in that area, in that area specifically, that's where their difficulty and their challenge was, was presented to them by their nemesis, by their four uncle. I think this is true also with, with Moshe and, and Aaron versus Dathan and Abiram. What's the first thing we're told about Dathan and Abiram? Two brothers fighting to the death. 
the thing that we know most about Moshe and Aaron is that they're the brothers that care for each other more than they care for, for themselves. Aaron is willing to take the bad seat for Moshe. Moshe wants to take the bad seat for, for Aaron. And many, many times we're told in, in the commentaries that Moshe and Aaron, Aaron and Moshe are sometimes presented like this, sometimes presented like that. They're a team, they're a unit. They exemplify the brotherhood and the kinship of brothers that care for each other. The first thing we're told about Nathan and Abiram is they are at each other's necks and trying to kill each other. So, I think that the concept is a powerful concept. Everything has to always be balanced. And there's always going to be a counterweight. And, Kol HaGadol Mechavero Yitzro Gadol Himeno, whoever is greater than his fellow has a greater Yitzhara. But I also think it's helpful for us not just to understand the scripture and, and, and the text. We all have some sort of enemy, some sort of nemesis, some sort of difficulty, some sort of Yetzirah, some sort of challenge that's tailored to help us achieve our greatness. And this is true on a national scale. We're told that the nation of Israel has another nation. The first nation amongst the other nations is Amalek. And we're given this as a foil in order to help us accentuate our greatness. Every person, on some level, in their own unique way, is designated for greatness. In that area that you are designated for greatness, you have to know you will face some sort of resistance. You're going to have your Dathan, your four uncle, your Amalek, your nemesis, your Yetzahara. And it is ultimately given to you, to your advantage. And that's a very powerful insight because it's a reframing of challenges, of difficulties, of maybe even people in our lives that really get under our skin and seem to kind of always be working in a way to oppose us. Moshe and Aaron, at the very introduction of the story and all along it, they have a counterweight. Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Israel. They have a counterweight. The nation of Israel, we have a counterweight. The Talmud tells us the greatness of a person will always be matched by the greatness of their Sahara. If you want greatness, if you want excellence, what does it take? It takes the, the resistance and the wrestling and the overcoming of an antagonist of equal strength. May we all be so fortunate as to overcome our difficulties, our challenges, in whatever way they may manifest themselves. And may we truly develop and polish and hone our greatness and achieve, please God, our destiny. I appreciate your attention. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. Send me an email with your questions, your comments, and your feedback.